Hello, my name is Marie Nidham, and I'm a professor at Soka University of America. Today I'm going to give you an overview to the taxonomy of class Acidiaceae, also known as Acidians. The common name of these marine invertebrates is sea squirts. They are invertebrate chordates, and they are the invertebrates that are the closest relative to the vertebrates. I'd like to acknowledge some image and information credit to Gretchen Lambert, Francoise and Claude Manio, and Rosanna Rocha. First, I'd like to talk about the anatomy of an ascidian. So what we see here is a solitary ascidian. Ascidians can uh, live individually, and they're called solitary, or they can live in colonies. So those are colonial ascidians. This one is a solitary ascidian. And if you take note of the oral siphon, that's where the animal brings water in. These are filter feeders, brings water in with all of the nutrients and food and collects those nutrients and food and then releases the water back out the animal out of the atrial siphon. And when we talk about dorsal side and ventral side of an ascidian, when we think dorsal side, we're thinking where the atrial siphon is, that side of the animal. So atrial siphon down all the way to the stomach and ovaries. When we think about the ventral side, we're thinking about the opposite side. So in this case, where the endostyle would be, the endostyle is an organ that produces the mucus net that helps capture the food and nutrients inside of the animal. We right now are looking at the left side of this ascidian. So if you think of dorsal on your own body as being your back and ventral as being your stomach, what we're looking now at is the left side of the cidian because the back is on the uh, dorsal side, the stomach is on the ventral side. So again, this is the left side of the animal. In the class Acidiaceae, there are three orders, and I've shown you some photographs of representative individuals of each of these orders. First, we have order Aplusibranchia. And all of the species in this order are colonial, meaning you have zoids that are genetically identical living in the same colony. The second order that we'll discuss is order Phlebobranchia, and most of these individuals are solitary. And lastly, ordos, order Stelidobranchia, where species can be either colonial or solitary. On the top right, we have an example of an Aplusibranc colony. So you might be able to see the individual zoids in there. They're all genetically identical to each other. In the middle, we have a Siona. This is an example of a solitary Phlebobranc. On the bottom, we have Styella clava, an example of a solitary Stelidobranc. There are also many examples of colonial Stelidobranc. And the goal of this lecture today is to help you understand which order of a city and you might be dealing with. So we're starting from the beginning here and you have an animal that you may see in the field or you may uh, it may be preserved and you're trying to figure out which of these three orders is it in. And in later lectures, I will walk you through more carefully for each order how to get to family, and in some cases, down to genus. But for just the purposes of this lecture, how to determine which order in the class Acidiaceae. And the most important thing to think about first is, is the animal solitary or is it colonial? If the animal is solitary, then your possibilities could be anything in any of the three orders, right? A Pelusibranchia has one family called Diazonidae with solitary members. 
It also could be flebobranchia. Most of the flebobranchia are solitary, or it could be stalidobranchia because there are colonial and solitary members. So let's try to differentiate between solitary flebobranchia and solitary stalidobranchia. Again, if it's a solitary aplusobranchia, it's a very, very narrow set of possibilities, one family, diazonidae. But the solitary flebobranchia and stalidobranchia, you have many, many, many more options, so that's what I'm going to discuss today. The first thing to do is, if you can, look at the external characteristics of the animal without dissecting it. And in particular, you want to look at the oral siphon. The oral siphon on the left picture here with this yellow solitary flebobranch, which is a siona, is staring straight at you. The oral siphon on the right-hand picture you can see is labeled there. And the atrial siphon is just offset of that oral siphon. So the oral siphon is usually going to be straight up and down um, following the axis of the body. And the atrial siphon is just going to be angled off a little bit to the side. And what you want to look at with these siphons is the number of folds. And they're also called lobes. So basically, how many of these um, uh, lobes do you have that make up the siphon? So in this left-hand picture here, you can see this pretty easily. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight folds of that oral siphon. If you have six or more folds in the oral siphon, which would be this example here in this left photograph, and if you also have six or more folds in the atrial siphon, so you need to count the folds on both siphons, then you're dealing with a flebobranchia. So I've bolded that order there. Again, six or more oral folds, six or more atrial folds, you have order flebobranchia. If instead you have four or six oral folds, and only four atrial folds, then you have a species in the order Stalidobranchia. So I've bolded the term Stalidobranchia there for you. In this picture on the left, the oral siphon is at the top of the photo, the atrial siphon is towards the bottom of the photo, and we can count four large folds, also known as lobes, in the oral siphon, and then the same four folds in the atrial siphon. This would be a stalidobranch. Let's say for some reason you can't see the external characteristics of the animal, or you would like more characteristics in order to be able to determine whether you have a solitary flebobranch or a solitary stalidobranch. What you can do is dissect the animal, open it up to see the internal characteristics. And what we're interested in here is the branchial sac. The branchial sac is the, a large portion of the internal um, section of the animal, and it is where the animal feeds, and it's where the animal takes in oxygen for respiration. We are looking for branchial folds, which are structures that are raised off the plane of the branchial sac. So they come up vertically from the animal when it's dissected. You can see on the right-hand side, this is an animal that's been cut open to reveal the internal characteristics. And these branchial folds are going to be oriented longitudinally, meaning they are going to be vertical. So they start in the anterior of the animal, that's at the top of the photo, and then go all the way to the posterior of the animal, which is at the bottom of the fold of the animal. So this particular uh, picture here, this animal has branchial folds. If the answer is yes to whether the animal has branchial folds, then you're dealing with a solitary stilitobranch. 
In this case, on the left, we don't see any branchial folds. So we see the branchial sac, and um, we don't see any structures that are coming off the plane of the branchial sac. So the branchial sac looks smooth here. If you don't see any branchial folds, then you have a solitary phlebobranchia, except for a family Pleuralidae in the phlebobranchia, which does have one left branchial fold. So uh, be careful of that. Uh, Pleuralidae is not a very common family, um, especially not in, in, um, in harbors, in marinas, etc. cetera. Um, but do be aware that there is a single branchial fold in one family of the phlebobranchia. But most of the time, if you don't see any branchial folds, then it's a phlebobranch. What if you have a colonial animal? We've figured out for a solitary animal how you tell whether you have a stilettobranch or a phlebobranch, but what if it's colonial? You have all three options here. In a plusobranchia, they're all colonial. In phlebobranchia, they're mostly solitary, but we do have colonial genera. And then in stilettobranchia, we both have colonial and solitary species. So let's take a look at the in the external morphology of the aplusibranch zoids as our first order that we're going to discuss. With aplusibranchia zoids, from an external perspective, the zoids are embedded in a common tunic. So let's look first at the right hand photograph. This is an example of what an individual zoid looks like when you dissect it out of the tunic. In the middle, what you see here, all of those circles are oral siphons of each individual zoid, and they are opened up to be filter feeding. You can't see the atrial siphons from this view because they are uh, underneath the surface of the tunic. And then on the left-hand side, this is zoomed out from the same colony in the center photo, so you can see what that colony looks like. So when you look at a colony, you, unless you look very closely, you can't necessarily see individual zoids. All you can easily see are the oral siphons of each zoid. So in the aplusibranchs, for the colonial aplusibranchs, the zoids are going to look like this, embedded in a common tunic. There are two exceptions. There's always exceptions in biology, as you might be aware. So for the rule that zoids are embedded in a common tunic in the aplusibranchia colonial ascidians, we have an exception for the family Clavulinidae and for some species in the family Euherdmanidae. This photograph that I'm showing here is of genus Clavulina in the family Clavulinidae. So instead of the zoids being embedded in a common tunic, the zoids are connected to each other at their base through structures called stolons. So you can pick out the zoids here, they're fairly large. This is called the light bulb ascidian because they have two uh, bright orange structures inside of the body. So every time you see a, a thorax, so the anterior part of the animal is gonna be fairly transparent, fairly colorless, and then running longitudinally in that thorax, you'll see the two orange lines. That's one zoid. And as you can see, they're, they're visible. Uh, you can count each zoid. They're not embedded in a common tunic. Again, they're only connected to each other at their base. So these are the exceptions to the aplusibranchia rule that zoids are embedded in a common tunic. What about the internal characteristics of aplusibranchia zoids? Uh, pretty easy to differentiate aplusibranchia from stilettobranchia and phlebobranchia if you look, if you pull the zoids out of the tunic. Aplusiobranch zoids have either two or three body sections, whereas stilettobranchs and phlebobranchs 
have a single body section, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you have two or three body sections, what are those called? What do those look like? On the left, we see an example of an aplusibranchzoid that has two body sections. A thorax, represented by TH, which contains the oral and atrial siphons, as well as the branchial sac. The second part of the body is the abdomen, represented by the AB there, abbreviation, and this contains the stomach, the entire digestive system, as well as the gonads, the ovaries and the testes. And in this particular case, you also see BP. That label BP, that stands for brood pouch. So in this particular zoid, the uh, embryos are brooded in a separate structure called the brood pouch that is um, basically comes off of the thorax, but it is in the, the same location as the abdomen is. So it's posterior to the thorax. In other examples of a plusibranchs, we have three body sections, a thorax, an abdomen, and a post-abdomen. So just like in the two body section zoids, the thorax contains the oral siphon, the atrial siphon, and the branchial sac. And there's also an abdomen, which contains the intestinal tract. So the stomach, the intestine, um, the rectum, the anus, et cetera. But the ovary and testes, which we call the gonads, are in a separate location post-abdomen because they are posterior to the abdomen. So in the two, uh, two body section of plusibranchs, the digestive system and the gonads are in the same part of the body. In the three body section zoids, the stomach, intestinal tract, et cetera, is in a different part of the body than the ovary and the testes. Let's talk about the second order of a city ACE, the flebobranchia. So again, we're discussing colonial animals and trying to figure out which order a colonial species belongs to. If the zoids are from the flebobranchia, they are not embedded in a common tunic like the aplusibranchia. Instead, they are connected by stolons. And this photograph is an example of Porophora japonica, which is a, um, it's a colonial ascidian, but sometimes you might hear the term social. What social means is connected by stolons instead of embedded in a common tunic. So all of these yellow circles here that you see in the photograph are the zoids. And then you might be able to tell that they are connected by very thin lines that are also um, the same color as the zoids. Those are the stolons. And again, those are how the genetically identical zoids are connected to each other instead of being embedded in a tunic. Internally, if we look at flebobranchia zoids, there's a single body section. Remember I said in aplusibranchia, there's two or three body sections. In contrast, the flebobranchs have only a single body section and the gonads are attached to the intestine. This is a really nice diagram from Richard Fox. And what we see here is the intestine is labeled. So you might see the stomach, then it's connected to the intestine, to the rectum, and finally to the anus. And then the ovary is attached to that intestine. It's what we, we say lying inside of the gut loop. So the intestine makes a kind of a U-shaped loop structure and the ovary in this case is lying right inside of that. And the ovary is physically attached to the intestine. The third order that we're going to discuss is stalidobranchia. Here are some examples of colonial stalidobranchs. Just like the aplusibranchia, if the species is colonial, the zoids are embedded in a common tunic. 
but the structural diversity is greater in the colonial solidobranchia than it is in the oplusobranchia. On the left, we have a batrillus, which you might be able to recognize similar to the oplusobranchs, we can see only the oral siphons. The atrial siphons we can't see because they are um, not at the surface of the tunic. In the middle, we have a symplegma. Symplegma, also a colonial stilidobranch, but the oral and atrial siphons both are on the surface of the colony. Same thing with the picture on the right. This is a Eusin styella, yet another genus of colonial solidobranch. And you might be able to tell each zoid has two openings here, both an oral and an atrial siphon that open onto the surface of the colony. And again, this is in contrast to the batrillus on the left, where the atrial siphons don't open onto the surface of the colony, they open inside of the colony tunic. And then all of that waste that's accumulated by all of the atrial siphons comes out the cloaca, which are these much larger holes in the colony. Stolidobranchia zoids, if we look internally, also have a single body section like the flebobranchia. But there's a big difference. If you remember in the flebobranchia, the gonads were attached to the intestine. In the stolidobranchia, the gonads are instead attached to the body wall. This is an, a picture of a botryloides. And on the left, you might be able to see the ovary, which is circular and orange. And it's on the dorsalmost side of the animal posteriorly. Just next to that ovary is testes, and they have multiple lobes, and they're kind of a, a purple color here. The photograph on the right is a zoomed in shot of that posterior end of the animal. So again, we can see the uh, ovary on the right side of the photograph, then just to the left of it, we see the lobed testes. And these gonads, the ovaries and testes, are attached to the body wall. You can see the stomach just below the ovaries and testes and the intestine attached to the stomach, but the gonads are not attached to the stomach or intestine. They're attached to the body itself, the body wall itself.